Inner's Act of Madness has got us uh, anchored in Horseshoe Bay. Um, Horseshoe sounds about right because horses' hooves aren't terribly big. And neither is this place. There are a couple of mirroring balls, but I don't know what size boats are intended for. So we've dropped anchor smack bang in the middle of the bay in open five metre line. We are on an extremely short scope of about three or four to one. Um, that scope will get longer as the tide drops. And what we've got to decide now is our departure time. <laughs> We do want to go back into Baltimore as the tide is running in, as the flood begins. But of course, if the flood's beginning there, the flood's beginning here as well. So that's something we do have to take into consideration. But for now, it's going to be lunchtime. Oh, and here's the mad woman back. Do you know that, do you know that book about the Golden Globe called The Voyage for Mad Men? Oh yeah. I think this is possibly an anchorage for mad women, but there you go. <laughs> the reason um, that coming into Horseshoe uh, Bay was a fantasy for me is that um, the, I'd seen a, before I even got to Baltimore, I'd seen an old pirate map of um, this area and um, Horseshoe Bay was clearly marked on the map. Um, it was an old map because it was all done by ley lines um, and one of the ley lines came into Horseshoe Bay. So in my Raving, imaginings. raving fantasies, I could imagine, uh, because it was a pirate map, I could imagine sort of like pirates living down here and uh, coming out and uh, harassing uh, passing vessels as they um, left. But um, the reality is very, very different. The reality is that the pirates did come here to Baltimore, but they came to basically take all the residents of Baltimore and sell them as slaves. So my imagining of the pirates uh, were sort of the like romantic daring. pirates of Baltimore with their dashing mustachios <laughs> and big cutlasses. Yeah, exactly. It's more like. Um, the the romantic uh, victims of Baltimore. Um, it's one of the reasons, apparently, that Skibberine is the big town around here. Apparently, a lot of people who, back in the day ran out of Baltimore and they went and lived in Skibberine because of the well inland. Yeah, and um, the number of people um, that they actually took from Baltimore, um, the population of uh, that is actually higher then than it was in 2016. According to that well-known, totally accurate informational source, Wikipedia. <laughs> right now we're going to go for Hamapedia, which is ham sandwich. <laughs> say about any motoring that you do is you get loads and loads of hot water which basically means salt salty lass. Shower time! We only literally, Horseshoe, Horseshoe Bay is literally just outside uh, the entrance to Baltimore so we didn't motor very far but by the time you've motored there, dropped the hook motored out a bit, did manage to do a little sail and motored um, back in, you got more than enough hot water for a good old shower and I feel like a new pin now. I'll be honest, being inside Horse Boots you bet, it felt like to me like us and the boat were in hot water. <laughs> I've learned something though and that is what Beverly and I feel comfortable with and uh, that was 200 metres across and we were thinking, we were feeling a bit confined. Also, the entrance was extremely narrow. Oh, that was even narrower than the... Um, with with plenty of rocks and shoals either side. Yeah, so... And, and, and about 10 metres channel, 10 metre wide channel to get the boat through. Yeah, so, so the thing is, that was sort of like at the upper limit of our... And you're depending on the charts being correct. I know, but I'm just saying that's that's something I learned today. It's just what Bevy and I feel comfortable with. And you know what? 
any any day that you learn something new has got to be a good day. And like idiots, we did it at low water. Yeah, well, what the heck. So what's happening, Bevy? I cannot describe what I believe to be the sheer stupidity of what's happening here. We came here and we anchored. Somebody's put a boat right in front of us, right over our anchor, or as near as. There's somebody's put a boat there, I think within inside our swing radius. And now somebody has anchored between me and the boat I thought was too close. And I went up and said, we'll hit you when we swing. And he said, no you won't. Well, what's he going to do if he's wrong? I mean, it's a 49 foot boat. For... I think what we're going to do is we'll go up and look at our options and move our boat because we're just surrounded by Okay, so what's happening now after that little oh. end? Well, Gator got the chappy on the boat to turn his AIS on and it turned out he was about 25, 30 metres away and we've got like 30, 35 metres to chain. I suspect he's the same. It's sort of like the, the amount of scope you put out in this. But anyway, uh, I think there's been a sudden intake of breath and he has moved. So we said thank you to him. It was nice of him to move. But that was a little thing I could have done without. We were actually about to move the boat. Uh, we have the um, we have the anchor controller light and ready to go, but we haven't had to do it. So that was a little surprise. <laughs> we're grateful to him though. We are. It's nice that he's done it, but I yeah, was... but it took you know it was sort of like we said. Can you please put the anchor <laughs> AIS on? Thankfully, you got him to do it, and I think that when you did that. That's maybe what caused the realisation because about a couple of seconds after he put the AIS on, he was running forward to lift the anchor. Yeah, because so, we were 30 metres away, even maybe a bit less than that. But You've got to bear in mind, that's 30 metres from our AIS at the back of the boat because ours is on the back rail. Yes, that's true. To his AIS, which could be in the same place. Yeah. So that's the backs of the boat we are 30 metres apart. Yeah. He's a 50 foot boat. We're, a, we're a, just shy of 40. So the upshot is that uh, if we swing, um, the front of his boat is fifty meters or fifty feet closer than his aerial, and yeah, ours is at the back. Boom. Yeah, nasty business. But we are grateful that he moved. Grateful, yes, but also extremely glad. Bevy in the galley, what we reduced to today? Well, today's a horrible day outside. It's very nasty. It's 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 grey. It's it's manky. I am still in my nighty. I it's five o'clock in the evening and I haven't got out of my nightdress all day. I've been in bed all day because it's not worth going out. It's horrible out there. So we're comfort eating, and we are in the process of making bacon toasties because when it's horrible and manky like it is out there. Bacon toasty is your comfort food, it's your friend. Yeah, you know, butter scraped over bread, nice fatty bacon and sort of like greasy stuff running down your chin with a big cup of tea. I mean, you can't really go wrong with that on a day like this. So that's what we're going to have. Oh yeah. Well, it's a uh, very windy, bumpy day here in Baltimore. Um, it's the roughest I've seen the ever since we've got here. We've been here for over a week now. But um, the remnants of, I think it's Tropical Storm Brett is busy running its way up the North Atlantic and we're just catching the eastern fringes of it as it comes past Western Ireland. And um, it's made for a bumpy day. I mean, it's a lovely day. Lots of sunshine. We're getting lots of work done down below in terms of uh, starting out videos and doing some other things that Gainer's doing with her web work. But it's not the most pleasant of day to be on the water in some respects. We had been planning to go into the pontoon, but that's just not happening. We've looked at the pontoon through the good old binoculars, and the only single boat that we can see on the pontoon is bouncing up and down and rubbing against it for a little bit. I'd rather be an anchor, to be honest. Um, last night, um, it was a hell of a gust came through at like two in the morning or something like that, stupid o'clock. 
um, the rain bouncing off the roof that accompanied it just woke me up in the middle of the night. It was horrendous and it's one of those where you lie there and you listen for the sound of the snubber snapping. <laughs> Thankfully it didn't. But you lie there and you think, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I'm not going to call down the gods of bad luck. <laughs> Poseidon's power or Neptune's anger. Oh, it's dreadful. But we've got sail bags flapping and everything's going here. But there's, I mean, this is a sheltered bed. It's about a quarter of a mile each way, I think, or thereabouts, a tenth of a mile, something like that. There's white caps everywhere here. And um, they're not big, there's not a huge sea state, but there's actually a sea state running in here, which is the last thing I ever expected. <sighs> I'm hoping it calms down. Generally speaking, my rule of thumb is that the blow was always at its worst between about noon and about four o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon. And then the sun is lower down, there's a lot less energy in the air, and things will generally calm down. Whether or not, well, whether or not that's true of tropical storms and things like that to make it this far north, I don't know. But I reckon I'll be fighting out pretty shortly. So this is the case of keeping an eye on everything and hoping this all calms down, because it'd be nice to have a calm day.